It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher. There's a scene in the new movie, Jesus Revolution, in which a parishioner meets in the pastor's study with Pastor Chuck Smith to complain about these hippies that have begun to invade their church in uh, Costa Mesa, California. And he raises some ob objections and then, and then he blusters that none of them even wear shoes. They're ruining the carpet in the sanctuary. Well, in the next scene, you see that same man walking up toward the church on Sunday morning. And there, at the entrance to the sanctuary, is Pastor Smith kneeling on the sidewalk in front of the entrance and washing the feet of each of the hippies as they come up to enter the church. It's a poignant moment in the film as the viewer observes these two opposing qualities, human qualities, of pride and humility. In stark juxtaposition, as the man stands there and scowls as Pastor Smith looks up at him and smiles as he washes another hippie's dirty feet. pastor, of course, was reflecting the love of Jesus. This man, this parishioner, was objecting to the intrusion of undesirables in what he considered to be his personal domain, the sanctuary of his church. Pastor Smith realized that it wasn't his church neither the man's nor the pastor's, but it was the church of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ loves and accepts all. So he knelt in silence, obedient to Christ, as he welcomed the unclean and the outcast 
into the building. Now this is the ultimate uh, expression of what Jesus was telling his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, which we just watched in that little video. When he wrapped a towel around himself, he took off his outer garments, got down to the garments of a slave, and wrapped a towel around himself, filled a bowl with water, and knelt in a gesture of humility and service to, watch, to wash the disciples' feet. As we begin a new series this morning on Jesus' last day, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, which will carry us to Easter, which, believe it or not, is only 42 days away. And that's a great thing to think about because flowers will be coming and the sun will be shining and it'll be warmer. But it's also a great thing to think about because that's the time that we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all that that means to us. We'll look today at Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and, and what important messages that act con conveyed to the disciples and, and what it should convey to us. And we'll talk later about sharing the bread and wine. That will be next week as we do our own monthly communion. About Jesus' prayers in the garden and about his arrest and his trials before the Sanhedrin and Pilate, and then his final hours before his crucifixion, that most important act that has ever happened in the history of the world. And I hope that this examination, as we go through the Gospels, will show us the depths to which Jesus willingly suffered for us to give us the opportunity for salvation. So let's look now at this scripture and let's go through it. That was read by the narrator in this video over this, this scene of Jesus washing the feet. And we'll begin with verse one, which sets the scene. <clears throat> this is John 13, verse one, uh, for those who have Bibles and are looking at them which sets the scene and lays the groundwork for the teaching that Jesus is about to deliver. It says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Jesus was acutely aware at this point of his impending death. And he knew that time was short to prepare his disciples. And there was much for them to do. They had a huge task ahead because they would be building the church. And he had just a very short time to finish those preparations. So he wanted to take every opportunity as it presented itself to teach them a new lesson and to teach them to love others just as he loved them. And I'm sorry, it was John 17, 1. I said 13 by mistake. So as they were all preparing to eat, let's look at verses 4 and 5. They tell us that Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured the water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, in order to properly understand what's going on here, we need to consider what role foot washing played in the culture at that time. People, of course, wore sandals, and roads were not macadam, they were not tarred, they were not concrete in Jerusalem, although the Romans did have concrete for some roads. But in the center of Jerusalem and in other areas, they were not concrete. They were dirt roads, and as they walked around in their sandals, their feet became filthy. 
I remember as a kid, and I'm sure you do too, running around in the summertime with bare feet. And your feet would just get unbelievably dirty. I remember I used to get slivers, and I'd run into the house for my mother to take the slivers out of my, the bottom of my foot with, with a needle or, or with a pair of tweezers. And she would look at my foot, and she'd say, how am I supposed to see a sliver on that dirty, filthy foot? Go and wash your feet. Well, that's the way these people's feet were as they came in to their homes or someone else's homes. So in Jesus' time, when a person entered a house, it was customary for them to wash their feet. There was a bowl of water and a bowl that was kept by the, by the door for that purpose. But if they were having a dinner, if they were invited guests into someone's home, they wouldn't be expected to wash their own feet. Instead, the lowliest servant of the household would stand by the door and would invite that person who comes in to put their feet in the bowl and would wash their foot and then wipe it with a towel. Here at the Last Supper, we see the disciples coming in for what is no doubt an important dinner. They've been invited by, by their Lord and Master to come to this dinner in the upper room, and yet they neither wash their own feet nor each other's. They just come into the room and they sit at the table. Now, we wouldn't expect them to be eager to watch each other's feet because we know that there was a, a sense of competition among them that had been growing as the weeks had passed. On numerous occasions in the gospel story, we're told that how they vied to be Jesus' favorite or they argued about who was the greatest among them. And that kind of prideful competition is not conducive to humility, to being humble and washing each other's feet. That was precisely why Jesus was giving this teaching at this time. Because he had seen this happen. And he knew that they weren't ready for the role of humility that they would be required to take in order to build and start and build the church. And he wanted to show them the importance of humble service. So to get a clear, a clear picture of how this foot washing was done, we need to understand that the disciples and Jesus were not sitting on chairs at a table with their feet flat on the ground underneath the table. Even though that Leonardo da Vinci's painting shows it that way, that's not the way they ate in those days. That wasn't the custom. Rather, they leaned on pillows on a very low table like a coffee table in our house. And the table was called a triclinium. It was typically in the shape of an upside down U, like so. And the host would sit at the head of the table, and the guests would sit down along the sides of the table, as you can see in this picture that I have. Sometimes they were oval tables, but typically U-shaped tables, because then someone could come up the middle of the table and bring food and set it down in front of the people. So when Jesus got up and he put his apron on, and he got his bowl of water, all of the disciples' feet, as you can see in that picture, were behind them, sticking out into the room. So it was easy for him. He didn't have to go on his hands and knees like a little kid that needs to go to the bathroom at a restaurant and scoots out underneath the table. He just had to go around the edges and at each one wash their feet. They were within easy reach. But imagine the reaction of the disciples as this happened. Here they were, too proud to wash each other's feet, and too busy or hurried or, or perhaps thoughtless to wash their own feet. And they're sitting there getting ready for the supper, looking forward to the food and, and drink to be coming in. And Jesus gets up from the table, takes off his cloak, wraps himself 
in an apron, just like the lowliest slave of the household, and then goes around with a bowl of water and begins washing their feet. I can imagine them pointing and, and whispering in disbelief to one another, what's he doing? Why is he doing this? They may have gasped in surprise and uneasiness. Certainly Peter had a reaction to it as we read in the next several verses. John, in verses 6 to 8. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? You can hear the shock and discomfort in those words, can't you? Are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, do you not realize now what I am doing? But later, or you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter's reaction, no, you shall never wash my feet. No. That's a pretty strong reaction. So why do you think Peter's responding in this way? Well, for all his faults. And we know Peter had plenty of faults, don't we? Again and again, he made mistakes. For all his faults, he did truly love Jesus. He truly loved him. And to see Jesus take on the aspect of a slave, of a servant, indeed, the lowliest of servants, and do one of the most menial and undesirable jobs, or tasks that a servant is asked to do in a household, was too much for Peter. He couldn't handle it. So despite being a disciple and therefore being subordinate to Jesus, he boldly and emphatically expressed his objection to what was happening. Listen to how theologian John Piper explains this. All of Peter's life, he had been taught that feet were dishonorable members of the body. They were usually dirty, frequently smelly, and among the most likely members to come in contact with things that the law declared unclean. Outside of immediate family, feet were washed by slaves and servants, ideally not uh, non-Jews, so as not to subject any of the covenant people to such a humiliation. But here was the Messiah, the most honored Jew to ever walk the earth, stripped like a common slave, with a towel around his waist, willingly handling the unclean feet of his disciples. This was backwards. If anything, Peter should be down there washing Jesus' feet. So this was Peter's frame of mind. And as he objected to Jesus washing his feet, as was so often the case, Peter was missing the point. He did that a lot. He missed the point. He had the whole situation backwards. Jesus didn't have it backwards. Peter had it backwards. The humility of the foot washing was the very reason that Jesus was down on his knees with a bowl of water and a towel. It was the best and most expedient way for him to teach the disciples the importance of humility and service. And he knew that they would be called upon greatly in the years ahead to perform humble service for the Lord and for their fellow Christians. So Jesus got down and dirty to do this, to make his point, and to teach the disciples. Now, when Jesus responded to Peter's bold proclamation, he did so in an equally emphatic manner, which was no doubt startling for Peter to hear and troubling. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Wow. Wow, that's strong. That was an ultimatum that Peter could not have been expecting to come out of the mouth of Jesus but it made its point. 
So in verse 9, the next verse, it says, Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Typical Peter, he goes over the top with his response. This is, for me, this is a bit of comic relief in a, a really tense situation that's developed here in this room. And I'm sure Peter didn't intend it to be comic relief. But a lot of times, the things that he did were comic relief in the Bible. He almost plays that role when he gets out of the boat and walks to Jesus. When Jesus says, come to me, when he's walking on the Sea of Galilee and Peter boldly gets out of the boat and starts to walk to Jesus. And then he realizes he's on water and immediately sinks like in a kid's cartoon. That's comic relief. But it has a point and a message. I think it was so important to Peter to be a disciple that he would have let Jesus wash his whole body right then and there. Just take off all the clothes and let him go for it. If that's what Jesus demanded of him at this point. But that's not what the, this was about. That's not what Jesus, the Messiah, was demanding. So in verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean. So Jesus washed Peter's feet and then went on to the remaining disciples and washed their feet. Now, let's think about this conversation between Peter and Jesus a little more deeply. Peter so loved his Savior that he would do anything for Jesus. Didn't Peter get out of that boat when Jesus invited him to step out and walk across the water on the Sea of Galilee? Wasn't it Peter who offered to build the tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah at the Transfiguration? Didn't, Jesus, uh, didn't Peter tell Jesus that he would go with him to the very grave if that's what was required of him as a disciple. But here, Jesus is asking a really simple thing, to just simply sit at the table and let Jesus wash his feet. And Peter objects. Why? Well, if you think about it, Peter obviously thought in that moment, then he knew better, that he knew better than Jesus did. This foot washing, he had decided, was inappropriate for the Lord and Savior, the Messiah. And he wasn't going to let it happen. He felt that he had to protect Jesus from this embarrassment, this humiliation. Why? Couldn't Jesus protect himself? Because was Jesus unwittingly making some mistake? This man who was perfect, the only perfect man who ever lived, was he somehow now suddenly making a huge mistake by taking on the role of a slave? Was Jesus acting inappropriately, doing something he shouldn't have been doing? Wasn't Peter, in effect, questioning and even repudiating Jesus' decision to wash the feet of the disciples? Get away from me, Jesus. You're not going to do it. But Jesus snapped him back into place pretty quickly. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Don't try and stop me from what I'm intending to do. I am the Lord and Savior here, not you. Jesus set him straight. Basically, he said, if you don't do what I ask of you, then you are rejecting me. And if you reject me, then you can have no part with me. And if you have no part with me, then all the things we've been talking about, salvation, eternal life, mansions in heaven, None of that is going to happen for you. Hard words from Jesus. 
the true ones. Because those who reject Jesus can have no part with him. He doesn't want people in heaven who reject him. That just brings discourse. You got another Satan on your hands leading a rebellion in heaven. Those who reject Jesus can have no part with him and no part of the eternal life that he offers. But this is just an aside in this play, this play that's, that's being acted out in this, in this parable in action that Jesus was presenting to the disciples. This was a side, an aside, and he was making a point that needed to be made to Peter at that time. Back off, I'm the boss. Once he had passed on from Peter, he washed the feet of the others, and Jesus went back to his main point. So let's pick it up with verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So, what's this about? This moment of teaching by the Messiah. It's about love. Jesus' love for them and their love and his and their love for one another. That's what this is all about. If he, their teacher and master, is willing to act in such a humble manner, a humiliating manner toward them, because he loves them so much, should they not also be willing to act with such love, with such humility toward each other? That's what Jesus was preaching here. That's what he was teaching. And that also extends to us. He may not wash our feet as he did for the disciples, but does not he regularly humble himself for us because of his deep and selfless love for us? I mean, when you think about it, this is the God of all the world. This is the God that created everything, created us, created the snow that's outside, the trees that are outside, created the wood that built this building, And he created everything. Isn't every blessing that he bestows upon us, every act of love that he does for us, an act of humility for him? He doesn't need us. His life is perfect without us. In fact, I have no doubt that we are a great aggravation to him. Don't you think so? A great aggravation to him. Just as Peter, we see again and again in the Bible, was a great aggravation to him. And yet, in his love for us, he willingly suffers those aggravations day in and day out. He overlooks them. He forgives them. And he gives us chance after chance to repent of them. He comes to us in his humility, not just as a man willing to face death on the cross, but as a lamb ready for slaughter. Think about it. He was the lamb to be slaughtered for us, and he knew it. He did it for us, for love of us. And do we not, like Peter, owe our complete obedience in return for his unending and unflagging love for us? I think we do. Of course, Peter repeatedly failed. And so do we. We repeatedly fail. And we will keep failing. But each time Peter failed, Peter came back with new determination. And so should we. 
Because Jesus, in his love for us, deserves all of that and more. So much more that he deserves from us. I want to end the sermon this morning with a quote from a sermon by the great 19th century British preacher Charles Spurgeon. I go to him a lot when I'm working on sermons because I'm one of the greatest preachers of all time. And he said in a preacher, uh, in a uh, sermon, it seems to me that the true text of this enacted sermon on the foot washing is to be found in the first verse of the chapter. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Our Lord washed the feet of his disciples to show that to the last moment he was full of the deepest and truest love to them and was willing to perform the most menial action for their good. Nor was this all, for we may regard this one condescending act as the pledge and type of his daily kindness towards all his own. Those deeds of love which the foot washing sets forth are continuous among us and are the sure tokens of his abiding love to us. So as we think this morning about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, think about Jesus washing your feet. And what would that mean to you? Would you, like Peter, reject that? Or would you humbly invite him to show his love? And think about showing that love to each other. How important it is that we emulate what Jesus taught us through the washing of the feet. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is humbling for us to know how you humbled yourself for us. And so, Lord, we kind of feel like Peter. Don't do that for us. But we know it's an expression of your love, your deep and abiding love for us, that you care for us, that you do these things for us. And we are so grateful, and we pray that you will help us to learn from this lesson and to treat each other in the same way that you have treated us, with deep and humble love and with great blessings. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our final song.